So welcome to the workshop on applied AI, what's possible and what's working in AI for government. While many of you are watching on the event platform, if you'd like the full interactive experience, please copy and paste the workshop link from the session description on the platform into a new tab and join us in Zoom. Before we get started, I did just want to begin by highlighting Ford 50's code of conduct. As we move many of our interactions online, it's important to remember that the code of conduct applies everywhere. It can be tempting to hide behind the anonymity of virtual platforms. We expect our community to behave in the same manner it would at our in-person events and to respect the code of conduct outlined on our website. Any online harassment of any kind will not be tolerated. We will take swift action to remove you from our virtual platforms and events should you act in any way that contravenes the spirit of this code. The code of conduct can be read in full by visiting the navigation menu on the main event platform. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Amanda Bernardo and I am a federal public servant with the Government of Canada, working with Shared Service Canada on leading enterprise transformation and engagement. I'm really excited to be hosting the workshop track today as we've had a great lineup of interactive sessions and this work next workshop is no different. Today's workshop will help us answer the question, what's possible, what's working, and where can I apply AI in government? Our special guests will provide a view across both technologies and use cases to provide a better understanding of which agencies are getting traction and what's already making an impact in the real world. I'd like to introduce you all now to Troy Agronon, who is the founder and CEO of Productive AI, a consulting services company based in California. Troy is passionate about helping business leaders understand and take action on emerging technologies, including artificial intelligence and machine learning, big data and cloud computing. He was an early team member focused on sales, marketing and partnering in five startups in the cloud computing space, all of which were acquired. I'd like to now turn it over to Troy, who's going to kick off this workshop for all of us. Hi, Troy. Thank you very much, Amanda, and thank you to the entire 450 team that has been putting on this event. I really appreciate it. And thanks to all of you who have showed up to be here in this session. We're going to make this fairly interactive. The interaction on some of the other sessions has been really, really great. So as Amanda said, for now, let's put everybody on mute and then we'll, we'll interact a lot in the chat and then we can open things up to audio probably in the Q&A. Leave time for that. So just, well, it looks like we still have some folks coming in. So I'm going to just quickly switch to this slide and maybe we can get things kicked off in the chat. What would be really, really great for me is if everybody could just pop into the chat and just leave something like your country, your agency, your department, any interest you have in this session, what got you here, that would be really great. And just fire that away in the chat and uh, we'll wait for another minute or so while more people filter into the room. That would be really great. I'll take a look at this here. Excellent. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Great cross section. This is, this is excellent. Thank you so much. Okay. It's actually, so I should mention this right up front. I am actually Canadian and I do live in the States and I've been down here for 12 years. So I did expect this to be a, a more international audience. Uh, it looks like we're heavily focused or slanted towards Canada, which is great. My home country. And it looks like we've got a lot of the departments, federal and some state, or so, sorry, province agencies. Okay, excellent. Well, I think with that, we've probably got enough folks in the meeting. So I'm going to go ahead and just kick this off. Thanks for that first jumping into the chat there. So my intentions for the talk are really to do five different things. First is to just give a very, very brief grounding in AI. I think that not everybody's always on the same page. So it always helps to just kind of set a baseline there. The second is to give kind of a high speed survey looking across a number of different government use cases in a lot of different agencies. I'm living in the States and have been for 12 years, 13 years. So I, I do have a, a large focus on kind of American examples with some Canadian examples, but you can extrapolate that to any country and any sort of similar agency. The third thing is I want to have, by presenting that, I hope that each of you can think about your agency and where you come from and kind of what the lessons are that you can extract from those use cases and how you might be able to use them in your own agency. And then at the end, if you're still here, <laughs> I hope you are, then I'll give you a few steps that, that I've learned working with some really great folks in the industry on kind of how to get going, how to get started, 
how not to commit sort of some early sins of, you know, going down the wrong track and building your AI projects and point you to some good resources and, and people in this space. So I'm going to add a couple more survey questions before we get going. So one to five, just toss it in the chat if you would. Put down if you think, you know, how fluent are you? One, not at all, all the way up to five expert. Let's just see a quick list of numbers coming in. So a lot of beginner, uh, a couple of intermediates. Okay. And some, some not at alls and an advanced or two. Okay, good. So it's, it's a real mix of folks. Second question is, is the agency that you represent actively doing AI? And that, you know, defined however you want, but, you know, one is nothing and five is yes, we have many projects on the go. You can see this the screen here. Just looking at the chat. Okay, great. Again, very broad cross section here. Excellent. Okay, Nancy, a few projects. Zoe, a few projects. Do we have any fives in here? I haven't seen any fives. We definitely have some fours in here, which is great. Fours and threes and twos and ones. Okay, excellent. And then the, the with that, I'm just going to move on to kind of setting a baseline. I'm sure all of you in this room know there are many, many, many definitions of AI. I think the funniest one is always AI is just whatever hasn't been written yet. It's kind of the things that we can't do in software, but as soon as you can do them in software, they're no longer considered AI. I think it's kind of a funny way to say it. I'm not sure it's super helpful. So I really love this particular quote. And there's a link at the bottom of this. Uh, and you can go see there were, I think, 70 definitions of AI. I particularly like this because I think it's very generic. You know, any system generating adaptive behavior that can meet goals and can adapt to its environment or operate in arranged environments. I think that's a really nice, very flexible model to think about AI. Another question that I see people asking all the time, and I ask this when I got into the field, is kind of like, what's the relationship between these things I hear all the time? AI, machine learning, deep learning, and data science and kind of how do they overlap? I actually borrowed this, this kind of diagram from Andrew Ng and Andrew I'll talk about later, but he's a luminary in the field. And he is the founder of Coursera, which of course, many of you probably are familiar with. And this was the model he likes, which is, you know, artificial intelligence is kind of on the outside. And then machine learning is a sub-function of that. Deep learning is a sub-function of that. And there is this kind of murky overlap between traditional data science as we've been practicing that for many, many years. And so in terms of focusing the rest of this talk, I also want to talk about where we are in the big picture of artificial intelligence. I have a couple of shameless self uh, promotional posts here, or, or slides rather, talking about posts that I've posted on our site, which is, you know, where are we in the big picture in terms of the very, very long view of artificial intelligence? And what we're going to focus on here in this talk is really, and what I focus on in my work, is artificial narrow intelligence, which is everything we have basically today. There are discussions, and what that means is artificial intelligence that can excel in a single domain generally not very complex things with lots of data and a single kind of task. And then there's this, this idea that at some point we're going to move towards something called artificial general intelligence. And often that's kind of conflated with or overlapped with AI that is as smart as humans and can operate in multiple domains and multiple complex environments. And then super intelligence being beyond that, the orders of magnitude beyond. We're going to focus very, very concretely on the here and now in the next 10 to 20 years. We don't even know how, if or when we will ever reach AGI. So I'm skipping that entirely. And if we zoom in a little bit further, and you don't worry, you're not going to try and read this. Again, this is on the site. The link is at the bottom. So feel free to grab that after. We've actually been doing AI in some form or another since 1935. So I won't walk you through this because that's not the point of today's talk. Just know that this has been around for a while. We've gone through a few winters. I think everybody's probably aware of that. But at this point, I like to think of it as kind of working through the four, the four types of AI that are outlined in Dr. Kai-Fu Lee's book. He's got a great book, I think, AI Superpowers. And he talks about internet AI, which has been around for 10 or so years, business AI, perception AI, and autonomous AI. I think of autonomous cars and robots and things. So I, I feel like we're, you know, we're, we're squarely in that section. And that's what we're going to talk a lot about in this, in this talk. 
Another way that I'm constraining kind of what we're covering here is, is are we talking technology? Or are we talking use cases? And all the stuff at the bottom of this table is foundational and works its way up. And what we're going to do is we're not going to be dealing with the bottom one, two, three, four, five, six rows. We're really going to be talking about kind of the three rows at the very top. So what is a generic use case? That could be a recommendation system or a risk analysis system or an anomaly detection kind of algorithm. That's a generic use case. Then how could it be applied by somebody in the public sector or somebody in the marketing department or the back office to create a specific application for them that might be, if you're coming from employment insurance, it might be an you know, a claims management tool or application. So we're going to really heavily focus kind of on that upper three layers here. And when I was putting together this talk, and I've been doing a lot of work more on the industry side than on the public sector side recently, I was looking at kind of catalogs and lists of where AI is being applied. And initially, when I built the slide, I had highlighted sort of in blue, well, these are the ones where, you know, these are being applied in government and these other ones are not. But ultimately, what I found is I found use cases in the public sector for almost every one of these. And so I thought that was pretty interesting. And so I decided to just leave the slide as it is, which is just here are a whole pile of representative use cases that you can find in the military, in public sector, in civilian government, or just in regular industry. And again, you're definitely not going to read anything on this next page, but I just want to show it. And there is a link here. This is a recent map of the ecosystem as built by VentureBeat and FirstMark Capital. Fantastic bit of work. They've been updating it every year. And it's the VentureBeat 2020 data and AI landscape. It's a rapidly emerging and changing ecosystem. There's a ton of interesting stuff going on. And so I would highly recommend you go check that out. That's the VentureBeat and FirstMark Capital 2020 data and AI landscape. So I'd, I'd recommend picking that up. So for the use case section, what I want to do is I'm going to sort of work my way down from international to national and then down to kind of state and regional. So I'm going to start with the international use cases. The United Nations has this really cool framework. It's a sustainable development goals framework. And they are using that as kind of a framework to hang a whole bunch of policies and actions and commitments from various countries. And the reason I'm starting here is that AI is actually having an impact on a number of these different goals. So I'm going to kind of walk through those very quickly. And I'm picking a select handful here. I'm not going to go through the whole 17. So I'm picking four or five. Number two, food and agriculture sector. They're looking for key solutions for reducing hunger and eradicating poverty. What's been really interesting in looking through all these different cases is some of the incredible innovation that's happening. This is a, a story from India. They had a $2 billion, 2.1 US dollar, billion dollar crop loss from pests. So this company called Madwani got together and they, they built an app and they gave it to all these farmers and the farmers could take snapshots of the pests on their crops and they would customize what they were, should do in terms of pesticide use. And long story short, they increased the crop yield by 25%. And they now are rolling this thing out to 18,500 farmers, which is incredible to, to protect the cotton crops. Another really cool example is a company called Blue River. And they came up with a way to essentially put cameras and computer vision onto a tractor. And basically, as the tractor is, is going across the field, it can then, instead of just spraying everything 100% covering the ground with pesticides, it'll literally spot the difference between plants that you want and weeds that you don't want. So that would be the red boxes on that image. And it would say, okay, I'm only going to put a little bit of pesticide right here on top of this weed, but I'm going to leave all these other plants alone. And it was so successful. John Deere actually acquired them a, a couple of years back and they're integrating it into their, their farming and their tractors, which is pretty cool. I see a comment about audio breaking up. Everybody let me know if that's uh, universal. I, it should be fine. I'm on a higher hardwired connection with a, with a good mic. So I think it's maybe on, on an individual end. Another really super cool example is 
robots that are able to pick a variety of different fruits and vegetables without harming the plant. And you, you'd say, well, do we really want to you know, bring robots into there and take that work away? The problem is that there's already a shortage of labor to do these kinds of jobs. So these guys are inventing these soft robots that can go in and pick very gently fruits and vegetables off without harming the plant itself, which is fantastic. This next one is uh, super cool. It's actually two different companies. There are, there are many more, Aero Farms and Plenty. And they're building vertical farms with high precision farming in terms of looking at exactly what nutrients, exactly how much water, exactly how much, or maybe no pesticides. And they're getting things like being able to farm vertically in these warehouses that are located close to the city, so close to the markets. So they're reducing transportation cost. They're creating the same volume that they, you could get out of a thousand acres of traditional field, reducing the water by 99%, and in some cases, reducing the pesticides to zero or near zero. It's incredible the innovations that are happening, and they're using a variety of AI and machine learning uh, tools along with, you know, the things like just the scaffolding and everything else. That's one of the things I saw a lot of. It's not always just an AI thing or a machine learning thing. It's often AI and machine learning augmenting, in this case, a farming system and using computer vision or some of these tools to sort of help them make better decisions. So I thought that on the food supply issue, I thought, you know, there's so much happening around the world there that if you are in any kind of agriculture supporting agency, these are things, if you're not aware of them, you certainly want to be aware of them. And if you are aware of them, they're things you probably want to be looking at supporting, funding, doing pilot projects, things like that. I think it's really worth, worth understanding what's happening in your country near your agencies. The second two, which I picked because they're sort of related, is this decent work and economic growth goal and industry innovation and infrastructure goal. I'm going to provide a lot of links through this talk. This is another excellent report, and this is written by the World Economic Forum. And they had some absolutely crazy quotes. What is this? By 2025, the time spent on current tasks at work by humans and machines will be equal. So that it's, it's kind of starting to balance out. And then they've, they've got this concept that, yes, we are definitely losing some old jobs. That's the 85 million old jobs going away. But we're gaining or could potentially gain almost 100 million new jobs. And so that for anybody involved in kind of reskilling, upskilling job market, you know, agencies, any of those kinds of folks, this is super critical because we need to be getting ahead of this curve and saying, okay, we know certain career paths are, are coming to an end. How fast can we get these people reskilled, upskilled, transferred, and, and moved into these other areas? And that's, you know, a combination of, of, of programs, and that's going to take funding and commitment over time. And that's, that's kind of a long window to sort of get ahead of. You want to put all that funding in place and put those programs in place and sort of, you know, adjust as you go. So I think for anybody in, in that sort of in the labor market space, that's really important to think about. I put these two together because I, I found some really cool stories in here. I'm going to see if this, this video will play for you. I tested it. It should work fine. Google, Oceana, and SkyTruth got together, and they built a system that actually tracks every single fishing vessel in the world in real time. This is absolutely incredible. It's never been done before. It's never been possible before. And they've been able to do things like track illegal fishing over a you know, billion and a half square kilometers. They've been able to identify vessels and whole bunches of vessels from various countries breaking fishing treaties. They've done a ton of studies with this work. It's been absolutely fascinating. This is an example of actually a marine uh, park that was set up, this red box kind of in the center of the screen here. And they used it to actually verify and audit that when they said, hey, this is a marine park, you're no longer allowed to fish inside this red line, that within a certain number of months, it looks like three or four months, that essentially all the fishermen left, everybody stopped fishing in there and so that they could protect the ecosystem in there. 
again, we've never been able to do things at this scale. And I think if you work in agriculture, if you work in fishing and land conservation, which is the next slide, these are things that maybe were never possible before, but we can now do because they're, they're machine scale, not human scale. This is uh, Western Africa. A team of researchers got 11,000 images and they ran them through their machine learning based image processing system. And they were able to find, and they basically said, look, we're looking for, imp for trees of a certain size. I don't remember, it was two meters across or something. And they said, find all the trees, all the tree canopies, mark them and count them so we can understand how many trees there are in the Western Sahara and then the Sahal. They found 1.8 billion trees across 1.3 million square kilometers. They literally counted every tree in the Western Sahara and Sahel, Sahel region. So their thought and other folks who've looked at their work said, this is incredible. We could soon be able to map literally the location and size of every single tree in the world. So for anybody in the forestry industry, uh, I'm sure you're looking at these solutions. And with the amount of geographic geospatial data that we can get and the machine learning that can be run on it, it opens up all these amazing possibilities for land use and land coverage and conservation efforts and things like that. I personally, I haven't found it, but I would love to find out if there's somebody working on kind of things like poaching and anti-poaching using AI. I think there's some drone work happening there. I'm not sure about artificial intelligence. The last of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals that I'm going to talk about is the number 16, peace, justice, and strong institutions. We have had many international treaties that we've built over the years to try to bring as much peace to the world as we can, uh, including Geneva Protocol, Outer Space Treaty in 67. You can see the rest of this list. It's looking like we will soon have, maybe, maybe in a few years, and it's some sort of international treaty on the use of artificial intelligence, the ethical principles, the governance, the, the responsible use of artificial intelligence. And I think that's going to be a really good thing for the world. Even having that conversation is valuable, but I think being able to put a treaty in place to say, these are the terms and conditions by which we all agree to play this game. And, you know, as we get into the, the further slides here on national strategies, I think that's going to become really, really important. I was very pleased to see that Canada, for those of you who've joined late, I'm, I'm Canadian, but I live in the States. So I was very pleased to see my home country as part of this initial group called the Global Partnership on Artificial Intelligence. And all the signatories are listed there on the right of the slide. Things like that are a great step, you know, regional agreements and hopefully soon international agreements on, on the ethical use of artificial intelligence. I'm going to pause there. And just before we shift into the national stage, were there any quick questions somebody wants to throw into the chat room just at the, the, the international level? We'll just take a minute or two and grab some water here. Oh, that's a great question. And I'm going to get the pronunciation of this wrong. Jean-Dron Véronique. I don't know if that got correct. Question on the old jobs that we lose and the new jobs that we get. Have you looked at the competencies required for the old jobs versus the new jobs? That's a really cool question. It's a great question. I think one of my favorite responses to that is, again, from the AI Superpowers book from Dr. Kai-Fu Lee. And his, his kind of grid, his two-by-two two grid that he often talks about is, you know, if we think that humans in those two by two grids, you always want to be in the upper right hand corner. So he's like, if we want to have humans have jobs, basically the things that they're good at are things that are complex and that are social and that are multi-domain. Those are the things that will be somewhat more reserved for humans to work on, whereas the things and low data, whereas the things in the lower left corner of that, that are sort of high data, very simple, don't allow or don't require a lot of communication and facilitation and coordination of other people. And they're kind of single domain tasks, things like processing a million you know, documents or counting every tree in Africa through you know, 11,000 images of, of satellite imagery. There are things that machines are very, very good at, and they're generally single domain, high volume. And then there are things that people are very good at, which are empathetic and complex and social and interactive. And so you can't get, at least today, you can't get artificial intelligence that can 
do those things. And so I think that there are a set of competencies for sure. I would highly recommend that book, The AI Superpowers by Dr. Kai-Fu Lee. Uh, oh, good. Thanks. I did get the pronunci pronunciation correctly. So let's dive into the national stage. Uh, also, we just want to check the time here. So we're, we're about on track. This is, and this is the funny part, as I was doing the research for this, I had articles that said there are now 26 strategies laid out and then 36 and then 45. And anyway, it looks like there are about 50 national artificial intelligence policies that have currently been published. That was February, 2020. So it's, you know, I'm sure there are five or six more at this point. I have the link in the bottom right. It's from Holonique. And I am proud to say that Canada was the very first country to release a national AI strategy. And that was back in 2017, in the 2017 federal budget, uh, five-year, $125 million plan for investment. And there were a number of parties to that. So that's pretty cool. Japan was second to release theirs. And that was also in 2017. And then in, I think it took 2019, it was February, 2019, by the time the United States, where I'm currently living, launched theirs. And they've done some iterations on that. But I think what's most important is many countries recognize they have to have a strategy. And from those strategies, you're starting to see an awful lot of funding. And some of these numbers are staggering. So I'll just let everybody look at these numbers first. And these are only going to go up. You know, if you look in, in again, I'm strongly in, emphasizing the U.S. case because I live down here, but you know, we have just in the DOD, the Department of Defense alone, there was $4 billion of spend and then another billion on just R&D and things like that. That's going to go up. And then the R&D budget is supposed to double. And there are some senators that are now calling for the funding level to go to $25 billion per year by 2025 and then continue at that rate all the way forward. China has a very, very well-documented national AI plan, and they plan to be the global leader in AI by 2030. And they're talking about spending up to 100 billion US dollars between now and 2030 to get there, and of course, continuing from there. So the, the funding levels that are coming along with these national strategies are staggering. And I think with good reason, because this is, this is a major evolution in our world. In Canada, again, this was pretty cool. Canada's AI ecosystem report from U of T that the number of active peer play AI firms in Canada doubled in the past five years to over 660. I mean, Canada is one of the world's leaders in AI. So really cool to see the economic impact of this kind of, of these national strategies. I'm going to cover a fair bit on defense. Again, that's probably my, my cultural experience of living down here in the United States. But again, this is appropriate to anybody in any country. Everybody has national defense organizations, of course. And I like this chart here. This came from the U.S. Army, something they call multi-domain operations or all domain operations. They basically talk about the five domains being space, cyberspace, air, land, and maritime. And in, specifically, they were talking about how do they use AI across the five domains, not just within the US, but across into an allied force. So with Canada and with our allies in the UK and in various places, how do you tie all that together? Because the systems are too complex. The networks are too complex. And at this point, you just, you can't do it with a bunch of people sending faxes and sending emails. It doesn't work. So there's a lot of research happening there. So I'm going to kind of go through each of those domains very, very quickly. And again, my purpose is not to catalog every single thing, but to just give you ideas that, oh, that's possible. Maybe something like that's possible with my agency or in you know a different use case. Everybody knows what 3D printing is. I'm sure we've had it quite a while at this point. There's a really cool company here. If there are company names, I'll generally call them out. I don't have investments in any of these things. This is just of interest for the purpose of the talk. Relativity space is essentially 3D printing whole rockets, 12 times faster. So two months instead of 24 with 1% of the parts count, a thousand parts instead of a hundred thousand parts. So you can imagine that if we want to move to space exploration at scale, this something like this might be part of that puzzle. 
they're just working through early stages of the business and validating all this stuff. So who knows if it, if this will come to pass at scale and become you know a big piece of the sort of space exploration puzzle. But I thought it was super interesting what they were doing and their three D printer uses machine learning to improve its capabilities. And so that as it builds more rockets, it learns and it gets smarter and it gets more able to do a better version of building these things, which is super cool. There's a ton of work going on. I did a podcast recently with a company called Booz Allen. They're a big defense contractor. And one of their partners is this company, Orbital Insight. And I went through a bunch of their materials and I can't remember the quote, but it was their CEO. And he said, literally, we can keep track of every single thing and every single almost person and object on earth over time. At this point, we have so much data. And so you can do all sorts of things with that. It could be agricultural, could be looking at forests, could be looking at wildfires, could be looking you know, in a military context, object identification. You can use it for urban planning. So if you're in more of an urban planning, sustainable development kind of a, a role, you can use this stuff to understand where are buildings going up and roads changing without sending people out into the field. So there's a lot of really interesting work happening in the kind of the geospatial space, sort of like the story with the, the trees in Africa. So I think that's worth kind of keeping an eye on. And like many of these things, they're, they're dual use, right? It's not good or bad. It's not civilian or military. It's all of the above. You can, you can use these things for good. You can use these things for ill. You can use them for civil government or military or industry. So it's taking that specific use case of geospatial technology and machine learning and applying it in your context with your agency for your particular you know, jobs that you need to get done. This is purposefully too small to read, so don't worry if you're trying to zoom in on your screen here. This is a report of ransomware attacks on state governments, state and regional, I think, local governments from 2014 to 2019. I come from the cloud world and then eventually the security world, and I was working at Cisco and I was selling it to state governments, actually. And so we did a lot of work on understanding kind of the growth in cybercrime, ransomware being one part of that. And if you look at these quotes, and I think these quotes are from the official annual cybercrime report from Robert Herjavec and his group. And it might be, yeah, I think it is. This is three select quotes from the five that cybercrime damage costs are predicted to double from 2015 to 21. But at the same time, we have three and a half million unfilled cybersecurity jobs. And the damage costs, of course, are also going up 57 times. So that what you have is this massive increase in cybercrime at the same time as we have a massive job shortage in cybersecurity. So I bring all of this up to say that the project we were working on at the time was actually a machine learning based security product. And it could literally listen to every single communication in your data center, in the cloud, across every single one of your, your offices, pull it all together and store, I don't know, trillions of, of those conversation, network conversations, and then look for patterns. And that is the future of cybersecurity because trying to plug the holes and have people look at logs and open log files and stitch together it's, it's said that generally most organizations have something like 150 to 200 security products from 70 different vendors, and they try to stitch them all together in order to make a cohesive security perimeter, and it's not working. And so there's this huge movement away from traditional security models. That's a whole other talk, but I really personally believe that we're not going to solve cybersecurity because it's such an arms race. I think it, it's going to require a huge application of AI and you're starting to see a number of companies emerge in that space, which are pretty interesting. Before I go too far, Min Lu had a question. How far or how many years are we from seeing the profit in term of cost or investment for AI usage in agriculture? I don't have a direct answer for you, Min Lu. I'm not sure about that. I think it's early days because a lot of these folks are experimenting with robots. They're experimenting with you know autonomous tractors and things like that and vertical farming, like the stuff I, I talked about earlier. So I think it's really early days. Some of the you know, some of the returns they're claiming in terms of, hey, we can do this in one tenth or a hundredth of the space and, you know, use 99% less water. I think there's some significant tangible benefits to it, but 
But I think at scale, uh, it's probably decades. But I think that's the kind of work that we need to get going on probably. I'm just going to continue on here. So the in, still in the defense bucket, and I've got a few more things here and then we'll switch, switch gears out of defense. I'm sure, especially down here, we're going through the elections, but you know, this is now a global issue of social media becoming an influence in the social discourse and politics and, and just civil conversation and how we as a people in any country get together and run our democracies and build our countries. So this is just a, an article. I think this was from, I don't remember which article this was. I don't have the, oh, it's from the Atlantic actually. And on the IRA, which is the Internet Research Group, can't remember the name, Research Internet Research Agency. It's one of the Russian agencies, and you know they've set up these farms. And not to pick on them, that the, there are nation-state actors all over doing this. They've set up these farms, and these farms do nothing but generate fake identities and then fake content for those fake identities. So you get things like newspapers that are allegedly set up where all of these people are fake. They were all generated by artificial intelligence. They're called deep fakes. And all of their data is written by somebody, ghost written by somebody in this, in this group. This is going to get much, much worse very, very fast because that content traditionally has been written by farms of people sitting there saying, oh, here are my subjects. I'm going to write this side or that side of a topic and then post it through our website. Now that can be machine generated. So now we're dealing with this potential tidal wave of content that will be automatically machine generated on every topic under the sun to make you know pros and cons and for and against and then distributed across the world. So there are, are massive Intel gathering projects to track these things, but it's very much like putting fingers in the dike and trying to you know stop it all. So it's really, there's a lot of work that has to be done here. Modsy, which is again, one of the companies, Boozell and Hamilton, they make a product called Modsy and I interviewed their team. They actually have a, an AI skill set built right into their system that will do deep fake detection. So it will look at photos and say, oh, I can tell that this is a deep fake and I'm gonna flag why I think it's a deep fake and things like that. So you're starting to see this kind of race between generating fake content and then detecting fake content super critical to politics and culture and democracy, I think, worldwide and applicable worldwide, no matter which country you're in. Again, this, I'm going to, I'm shifting gears a little bit and then I'm leaving this in the national defense bucket because it's so often used here, but you could apply it anywhere. Facebook's most recent project that they released on AI can translate directly from any of a hundred languages to any of a hundred languages. They don't have to go through a common language like English. So you're talking almost 4,500 language combinations and they trained it on almost 8 billion pairs of sentences. So they're no longer doing it at the word level. They're doing it more at the sentence level. And that's turning out to be a lot more accurate. So you can run these kinds of systems in real time. And I know folks in the defense agency who literally have chat, that's pulled from all the social media and that's coming in a real time being translated in real time and then translated to multiple languages so that their in their analysts can then go through and then machines are then both translating it and also assessing it and under and interpreting it all so a lot of this stuff is moving to the machine language world at scale i've got a few more and then we're going to jump out of the out of the defense world and i'm also going to look at the clock here at 12:40 so this is again a case of the next one is actually, so I'll, I'll, I'll pause and do this one first. So this is actually Skyborg. This is a project from the United States Air Force and they're actually looking to build wingmen. So essentially they're not drones because they're not driven by a pilot who's sitting in a base somewhere else. They're actually clones that sort of follow along with the primary pilot. So primary secondary. And so the pilot can be flying his, his fighter jet and then this secondary drone can be essentially his wingman or her wingman and fly with that pilot and essentially double their, double their force. And they're, so there's a whole project for this. There are multiple contractors working on it. So it's autonomous, but linked essentially with a, a primary pilot. 
shifting gears more to the, the mechanical aspect of things, the Air Force is also looking at predictive maintenance. And predictive maintenance is a cross-cutting use case. You see it in oil and gas, you see it in the auto sector, a lot of manufacturing. So it can apply to industry. It can apply in many, many places. They're using a bunch of tools to essentially track how soon they need to replace parts. The biggest common problem in predictive maintenance is you don't know when something's going to fail, but you know something's going to fail every certain number of hours on average. So people just build in a replacement parts schedule, and that can be very expensive and very time consuming. So you're better off to have some kind of system that can, then, that can track actual wear and tear versus just kind of guessing at it. And you can reduce you know, parts churn and costs and things by 50, 60, 70%, depending on the case. I'll get back to Brandon here in a sec. So that's, you know, predictive maintenance again, I would say is the use case and the application of that to keep those separate would be in this particular case, the Air Force is using it to potentially predict when to replace parts on the helicopters to make that more efficient. But you could apply that in your own domain. That could be, you know, a fleet of, of vehicles in forestry in situation or context. So just try to apply the use case to your own context. Only a couple last ones here as we sort of work our way through the five domains. On the land, and I don't know if any of you have seen these yet, I've seen these dri you know, driving around in Palo Alto near where I live, where you actually see you know, a much cuter version of RoboCop. It's certainly not the one that we all know and love from the movies. It looks like a big egg and it rolls around on its wheels. And essentially there are police departments all over that are, are testing these things out. And they've had some pretty interesting successes. The city of Huntington Park in California did some trials. They had some positive results. I think I saw somebody in our group here today is from, actually a number of you are from the Veterans Administration. So the U.S. Veterans Administration Police Department actually took out a, a trial contract with a, one of these vendors. So there's a lot of interesting stuff in this kind of autonomous mobile robot. Nick can just roll around and interact with people and chat with people and you know catalog everything and then flag things using machine learning and send those back to the operations center to say, hey, this is something the humans should pay attention to. So it's very symbiotic. So it's an interesting development. Last one I'm gonna go through is, is Sergeant Star. Now this is a virtual, it's a, it's a chat bot basically. And it was created by the army for recruiting and for answering questions. And what they've been able to do is actually have it answer as many questions as 55 people sitting in a call center, which they just didn't have the budget for anyway. And it'll answer up to 800 different questions. And he lives in all the different social media platforms and things, answering these questions and constantly learning and improving and they're apparently he's, he's showing up and kind of, he's become quite a celebrity. So I thought that was kind of a funny use case. So it's really kind of an advanced conversational AI use. And really at the end of the day, it's customer service. And it's, you know, this is the same thing that any agency can use, which is front end customer service, answering lots of questions. You know, that's, that's going to be applicable to any agency with a very high volume of inbound calls and, and questions. So we're going to jump out of uh, defense to kind of other civil government things. And then I'm going to, I want to step down into regional and then we'll sort of get into the, you know, what do you do next? A uh, couple of interesting stories. I actually found this one. Oh, that was November 5th. So UK now using, or they've got a contract to essentially have somebody assist them with some machine learning to collect all of the intake data from Folks, if they, if they put out 60 million or 70 million vaccines, they said they just can't deal with the deluge of potential folks, you know, one in a hundred, or I think it's one in 10,000 folks who would come back and say, I've had this or that side effect. They have no way to manage it all. And they want to get that many vaccines out, but then they need a way to respond, a way to collect that data and a way to sort of understand what the, the side effect sort of you know, response is going to be. So I think that's a great case of, again, it's kind of a customer service and medical use of collecting a lot of data and then going through and finding those patterns. So I thought that was a great story. 
our weather body, NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, they got together with Google and they're doing some really cool stuff to improve weather monitoring and alerting and all that kind of stuff. So of course, you know, we have those agencies in every country. So that's that's an area where every weather agency could and should be looking at these kinds of tools. Transport Canada is doing some really cool stuff where they're doing, they're assessing, I think they call it the bomb in a box test. And they're basically trying to assess based on a whole bunch of different data points, which things are likely to be risks or not. And sort of th that way they can speed up which ones the humans are looking at or not. So again, it's that symbiosis between let's have a machine crunch all the data and then make recommendations to the humans who are going to do the work. So I thought that was a great case. So I'm going to pause there before we go to the regional kind of provincial state level, city level, see if there are any questions about any of the, the national work. Brendan, so Brendan Carroll has a question. So are countries actually restricting their AI research due to any treaty? Seems like the sky is the limit when it comes to autonomous weapons platforms. I don't... I don't know of any countries that are actively restricting their AI research. Not that it's not happening. I'm just not aware of it. And I think that that's, it's, it's a common point of discussion. And I think that's where a lot of these international tr you know, treaties will come from, which is a number of parties getting together to say, this is in bounds and ethically viable, and this is not and shouldn't be undertaken, right? We have treaties for biological weapons and for nuclear weapons and non-proliferation. So I think there will be a lot of those agreements that will be made. Will they be by 180 countries? Probably not, but they probably be made by the top 50 countries that have significant artificial intelligence talent and competitiveness and skills. So yeah, I don't, I don't know. And you're right. The sky's limit when it comes to autonomous weapons platforms. I think that's a big part of the discussion, honestly, between a lot of these groups is what's, what's viable and what's not, what are we allowed to do and what are we not allowed to do? And I think there's a lot of work to do. So if you're at all interested in the international stage, I would say, go find a way to get involved because those conversations are happening everywhere. Okay, so I'm going to jump into regional and then we're going to just kind of get more concrete and be like, okay, what, what, what can you do with all this information if in your own agency? So some cool regional use cases. This is actually from California where I'm currently living and this is the National Guard. Now they have drones and of course those are military drones. They're not always tasked with military duties. So they actually have done a joint project to help track fires and use that geospatial mapping except closer, right, from the drones, download all that data, run machine learning on it, and actually accelerate how fast the National Guard can understand what the fire outlines are. And so they're working with Cal Fire and a few other folks, a few other agencies down here to accelerate and speed up the time to collect the data and process the data and understand the spread of fires. Again, hugely appropriate to do something like that in Canada or in Europe that has a lot of uh, force to, to look out for and wildfire issues. So I think that stuff like that to me is very, very interesting. NVIDIA is doing a ton of work. Uh, again, they're just one of the many, many companies doing work, but they're heavily involved in the space in kind of the smart city, tons of companies in the space. But I think that the smart city really doesn't come to life. It doesn't make a lot of sense until you apply AI. They've got, what is their quote here? 30 billion images a second and 100 trillion images an hour. You know, humans, again, can't process that. There's no, humans will never look at 99.99999% of those images because they can't. And so they need a way for systems to look at them, process them, triage them, route them, and make recommendations, say something's going on over here. And there's been a really... I think a really cool progression in that. Initially, you'd see you you would see things like Shot Spotter, these various tools. It would listen, right? They're acoustic listening devices. They would listen for the correct patterns, and they'd say, "Oh, I think that's a shot that's been fired from whatever gun." They'd triangulate it, and they'd route that information to the police, and the police could go be on the scene in a few minutes. That kind of led to this predictive policing model of. Okay, well, let's look for high-risk zones 
and let's just up the police presence. Let's do more patrols. Let's, let's assume there are going to be problems because there were always problems there in the past. But I think the, the most interesting thing that's kind of emerged is things like this. Dr. Diane Daly is, I haven't had her on the podcast yet, but we've talked and she's doing some fascinating work. She has a, an organization, a nonprofit uh, called Predict, Align, Prevent. She is and has been a life, almost a lifetime, 2015, 17 year anesthesiologist in pediatric hospitals. And she saw a number of cases over a number of years of kids coming into the you know, emergency room with life-threatening injuries, and some of them would not make it. And these were fatalities and serious wounds, wounded cases that were coming from their families, from abusive homes and things like that. So she made it her mission to build a system because of her background, her interest in data science and machine learning and all these different things to essentially pull all the data from all the various databases and all of them are in different formats and all cover different areas and different geographies and different ways, pull all of that together and essentially make predictions and say, we think that these red dots here on the screen, those blocks, there's a very high degree of likelihood that a child will die in their home from an accident or from an abuse situation in the next three months or whatever. I'm not sure the, the time frame. And then instead of kind of overloading those districts or those neighborhoods or even those blocks with police presence, there's this move towards understanding maybe it's a lack of social services. So they also map on the right of the screen here, things like churches and community centers and fire stations, libraries, places where kids can be safe and then be able to sort of look at the difference and say, hey, we think there's a high risk of children you know, being injured or maybe even killed in these zones or in these blocks. It's missing some services. How can we predict that, align the services, and hopefully prevent those injuries or deaths from happening? Fascinating work. And I love to see more of this model happening of moving away from, this is a, a traditionally problematic area. Let's you know put it more of a police presence to this is a this is a traditionally problematic area. It has a high risk of things happening again. Maybe it's a shortage of services. What more can we do there? And I think that's a very progressive model. Uh, I just saw somebody say, that's awesome work from Rani. Yes, I agree. She's super cool. If anybody's interested, please reach out to her. Predict, align, prevent. You'll find her on Google. I'm so looking forward to doing the, uh, the podcast with her. Very, very cool lady. Actually, before I switch off, there's one, one more cool thing too. So Thorn, uh, I think Thorn on a Rose is Ashton Kutcher's day job, the actor. And he got together with a machine learning shop and they have identified 6,625 victims of human trafficking. And they've brought more than 2,000 traffickers to justice. And they basically built a whole machine learning and artificial intelligence platform that sifts through massive amounts of data, cross-references images and social media posts and phone numbers and all sorts of things and delivers that to the investigators in the respective agencies. And they've, they're making a huge dent. So I think using these tools at scale across geographies, across boundaries, across cities and states and provinces is, is where we're gonna see a lot of really interesting and great stories coming up. So super excited about that one. So with that, I think we're right on schedule here. I kind of wanted to get by the top of the hour into sort of the the nuts and bolts of like, what do you do? <laughs> it sounds like at the beginning, we talked about for those who joined late, we sort of did a quick survey. And it sounds like we've got a real spectrum of attendees from I don't know anything to I have a whole bunch of or a few projects running in my agency. So just some thoughts from some folks that I have a ton of respect for. Andrew Ng, he's co-founder of Coursera, former chief scientist of Baidu, a founding lead for Google Brain, incredible man. He's, I think anybody who's learned anything about machine learning and AI probably started learning from him. He has a great thing called the Transformation Playbook at his, one of his many, many companies and projects is Landing AI. Uh, I highly recommend you go check this, this playbook out. The thing that I want to highlight here is he says, you're not going to think this is correct, but strategy development is actually the fourth step, not the first step. 
He said, you really need to get a few projects under your belt, get some momentum, get some learning, build some in-house kind of competency, build your team and really get broad training across the organization. And his rationale for that, which I love is if you do a strategy without having that prior experience, you'll build some fantastic, very academic strategy that has no hope of getting executed. But if you've built a few projects, you've got some things under your belt, you really understand the use cases and what the, the capabilities and the limitations are of the technologies, then you can start to map directly and say, okay, this is a viable project. We might have a chance of succeeding with this. It makes sense. So I really like that sort of, you know, backwards approach of start small, get some learning, build your team, and then develop your strategy. And then of course, communicate widely. So I highly recommend the playbook. I would say just download it. There's just a link on their site. The, the, the second group that I want to talk to, is, you know, the, their material that I want to talk to is Emerge AI Research and Advisor. I reached out to them after finding a whole bunch of their material and talked to the, the founder and the CEO, Dan Fagella. He's got a great podcast, AI and Business, AI and Finance and AI and Industry, I think. Three different podcasts. Really nice guy. I am a part of their Catalyst network of providers. And so we use a lot of their material. This is not public information. This is not on their public facing website. I think this is part of their paid reports or things like that, but he did give me permission to share it with everybody here. And so from his perspective, having been involved in hundreds of projects and working, working with hundreds of, of AI vendors is that really this is the critical competency is getting your team up to speed, understand your own goals, understand what AI can do, understand what the possible AI use cases are, and then connect the dots between those three things. And he's got a really great sort of three-step process, which is, you know, I think it's fairly straightforward. Understand your core organizational agency priorities. Everybody in this meeting probably has three or four things or five things that your team has committed to the public or to your board or whatever the structure is of your team. Those things are your anchors, right? And then from there, become fluent in AI, learn what it can do, what it can't do, what the limitations are, what potential use cases are there, and then start to connect the dots and think, maybe we could do some experiments to address key priority one, and maybe some other experiments for key priority two. And this is all very experimental. And that's kind of a key thing to recognize is you're not going to be expert and you're not going to succeed every time. These are much more science projects than they are traditional IT projects. And then once you've kind of narrowed those down, then you can start to sort of really do some risk analysis and say, here's some low hanging fruit. Let's test 1B. And what's the other one? And nothing in priority two and maybe 3A and 3B and we'll skip to you know, 3C and sort of pick the low hanging fruit where you can get some early wins, get some momentum, get some more education for your team. And I think that taking that kind of making sure you're anchoring it to your core organizational priorities, one, that's a good way to make sure you get funded. And two, it's a good way to sort of ensure that it's taken seriously because it's going to require training and education and just time and fluency in team development. On teams, one of the things that we're seeing is centers of excellence where a, a single team is basically inserted and then they provide information to all the other teams in that department. So you might look up um, some of that. And I've got one last slide and then that's, this is really just a rehash of that, but it's, if you want to be successful here, it does, like many big changes, this is a change management process and it's also an IT transformation process and a process transformation process. And it requires understanding kind of the cultural aspect, the skills, and then just basically having the resources, having the systems, having being data ready, having data warehouses, knowing how to use them, using cloud infrastructure, knowing how to use that. So all of the kind of pieces of the puzzle are, are required for you to develop some AI maturity. And that's going to take, you know, and Andrew Ng would say that would take two or three years to develop some competency and capability in your team where they can really start to get some significant momentum. So I'm going to cap it there. What are we at here? 102. So that was kind of my goal was to end at the top of the hour and just move into a discussion. I'm happy to do that on the chat. I'm happy to do that on, on video and audio. And I think Amanda and Catherine are going to help us with that. So I'll, I'll just open it up and I see Amanda on the screen here. So. 
Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Troy. So if you want to speak using your camera or mic, feel free to just use the raise hand function. You can do that by selecting participants at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Or if you prefer to ask your question in the chat, Troy and I can monitor the chat and take it from there as well. So feel free if you have a question to raise your hand or drop something in the chat. While we're waiting for some questions to show up, I'll just take a look through the questions that are here. Some, some good conversation from everybody chatting away. Let's see, I'll go back up to this. How can we, let's see, maybe this. Yes, Jacques Thibodeau had a comment. These algorithms can also amplify police activity in areas where there are more minorities and leading to an increase of false identification. It's important to be careful. Jacques, I could not agree with you more. And this is a huge conversation down here where I am in the States. And again, I am Canadian, but I live down here. This is, there are a lot of police agencies that were using facial recognition. They were also using predictive policing tools. And the combination of those two things essentially led to exactly what you just said. More police presence in certain districts, more use of facial recognition, which isn't always accurate, and in fact is less accurate on African Americans because of the skin pigment, things like that. And it led to a number of situations, and I think that there are police departments that are now stopping their use and, and or analyzing that use. And you're starting to see a, a very public conversation about what is and what isn't appropriate use of AI in a sort of a regional, you know, let's say a city municipal police force. Should they be allowed to have it or not? Those are all good conversations. And I think you're, you're bang on. There was a question earlier that said, how far, how many years are we from seeing profits in terms of cost investment for AI usages in agriculture, for example? Yeah, I think that was Min, Min Lu. And I, I think my answer to that was basically, it's a long way off, but we need to get started. There's so much potential there. And there are so many early return signals we're seeing in terms of pesticide reuse, or sorry, reduction rather, water reduction, which is huge. Things like the, the crop yield, the Madwani AI. You may have briefly just lost Troy. I know there was a lot of people, including myself, that were kind of thinking, you know, we're beginners and, you know, that's why we want to be here to kind of learn about these ideas. Some people do have a ton of experience though, and maybe it's just hearing, you know, different angles of some of the, the speakers coming in, but we'd love to hear if anyone wants to help kill some time with me as we wait for the tech to regroup, you know, what brought you to to this workshop specifically on AI or what's attracting you to this theme of AI? And perhaps are you working in it in your current organization? So if there's others that are working in this space, I'd love to hear how you're maybe applying AI in your neck of the woods. If there's anyone who's not shy and wants to raise their hand and join me. If not, I can just keep on going. I'll review some of the, the chats that are coming in. So we do have some questions getting lined up for Troy. So as he uh, reconnects, we'll certainly direct those to him. I'm just gonna scroll up to see if there's anything else I can see. I know there's a few colleagues I can see joining from other government departments. I uh, don't know if you guys are using AI specifically in under any of your programs or services, if anyone wants to jump in and share how they're using AI. And there are a few people outside of government that are also here with us. I'm not sure if you'd like to also share. So it's okay if you're, if you're shy and prefer not to be on camera, that's okay as well. Still, we're getting a lot of questions in, which is great. So we'll have a ton to throw at Troy once he reconnects. I see Eddie Rowe definitely came to get ideas where it could be applied within our organization, possibly in terms of fraud detection and data and anomalies. Very great point, especially I think in the government context, I know oftentimes we're playing catch up. So we do learn from private sector organizations, how can we, you know, learn from what's already being done in the private sector and even learn from lessons learned that they've already reached. You know what I mean? When you're, when you're trying a new technology or a new service, oftentimes there is that learning curve and you see these instances, for example, in the police force where it might not have worked as you had thought. And so learning from private sector organizations that are already using technology like AI to then apply it to a government context is certainly helpful for our efforts. Ivan, I can see that you had a question. Do you want to unmute yourself? I'm oh, also back. back. Oh, perfect, Troy. No, I'll, I'll let just, Ivan go no, ahead. No, that's that's fine. Go ahead. You're back. So there's lots of questions. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Oh, no. Yeah, please. Yeah, sorry about that. I don't know what happened. I don't know if that was Zoom or, or something else. 
No so worries. We, we plan for that, Troy. It's, it's okay. Your connection is still a bit wonky. I'm not sure maybe if it'd be easier to stay off camera, it'll use less bandwidth perhaps, but we did get a ton of questions in your absence. So I'll start with the first one that came in. Maybe I'll just get a, a signal from you if you're still a bit, still a bit wonky, Troy. And um, maybe just do a quick sound check if we can to see if it's um, back up and running. How about while Troy tries to get his audio, Ivan, did you want to jump in with what you were going to add earlier? And, and we'll see if he can get his audio working. Yeah, sure. I guess I was just going to say like within, I guess I work with Canada Revenue Agency. I find right now we're kind of being told that, or at least our area is kind of recognizing that, hey, AI is important. And we're kind of being told from a top down of like, here's AI, find some uses for it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess maybe part of the reason why I'm here was actually to kind of generate some ideas, but it is kind of a strange approach that we, we're looking for solutions for to, to use AI for rather than kind of identifying problems and seeing AI as being a potential solution for solving it. Yeah. I'm not sure I think how that's... people or areas are kind of coming across the same thing, but that's kind of what we're seeing right uh, now. That sounds great. I'm off video, but I'm, I can hear you. Yeah, so I, I would definitely, that that's that's typical of government. You know, I, I often give the example too, it's not tech, but you often hear testing, testing. when social media was starting that people would say, testing, testing. you know, I want social media to resolve X, Y, and Z. And it's like, well, no, social media is a comms tactic. You don't put the tactic ahead of the problem that you're trying to solve. And that's really true of tech as well in terms of trying to identify the problem first. If we're just throwing AI at something and I, AI might not be the answer. It's important, especially I'm a very much like speak the truth uh, to power type of public servant. And it's sometimes really important to use that voice to recommend the right approach and really guide people through exercises like this to say, you know, while yes, you might want AI for this, maybe it's better that we use something like this or in an instance where AI isn't recommended to say this could make our lives a lot easier if we applied something with AI. I did hear, I think Troy's audio being tested. Troy, are you back with us? I am. I don't know how good it is. Perfect. No, we can computer hear you. Up. We can definitely hear you. That's awesome. Okay. I'm going to hit you with a fast round of questions because we have about 15 minutes and we got a few questions in while you were um, gone. So I'll, I'll read the first one. So it's a generic question. It's from Posivana. I hope I pronounced that right. I have been working in the field of DevOps and cloud. I'm really passionate about working in AI. Whenever I speak to people, I heard AI courses certificates are not enough to get a job in AI. You need domain knowledge. Since Troy, you are in the you are the first person I've heard who moved from cloud and security to AI. What is a recommended pathway? Really great question, Posibana. Yes, excellent, excellent question. And I think that the, so I came out of cloud. I did come out of that space, as you know, the IT and the cloud computing space. I, there are so many courses and so many places that you can learn. So what I would do is I would recommend strongly that you start to look at things like Coursera, Udacity, MIT Sloan has programs, all the major universities, UT probably has programs. And I would say, start to look at those and start to build up your skills and your knowledge and just get into the space. Everybody was so welcoming when I reached out and said, hey, I've spent all my life in cloud and now I really want to get involved in AI and machine learning based on some things I was doing before. Everybody was very welcoming and said, great, come and help out. There's so much work to do. So I would say just, you know, make the leap to whatever degree you can, learn what you can, network with everybody like you're doing here today. And, and you, I think you'll find it a very open and receptive community. Great answer, Troy. If I can add anything, I would say, you know, professional development is always huge. And if you even volunteer in a space that helps add from the learning to your experience, it does wonders, especially if whether you're government or private sector. We have another question, Troy. It's how about using AI to read screen the situation during a police encounter and tell the police what type of intention the other person might have and what type of action to take. And that was from Shamir. Shamir, that's, a, that's an interesting question. And I've actually had this conversation with a company called Perceptive Automata, and, uh, Automata, I get, keep getting their name incorrect. They're making smart cars, basically autonomous cars that can read body language and in understand the person's intentions and understand is this person who's just standing statically at the side of the road 
are they intending to cross the road, which is different than what autonomous cars do today. You have to be actively running across the road for them to understand that that's a potential risk. So they're using that technology to look at body language and uh, there's a whole branch of something called psychophysics. And they're basically making a judgment call and saying this person is interested in crossing the road and is aware of me or not. They were asked if that could be repurposed. And I think that the way it was asked was, could you put that technology in an airport? And I think it's similar to your question. Could you look for patterns of suspicious behavior? Their response, and I think it was the CTO, Sam Anthony, I was talking to, his response was, we're designed to, to pick up on the very human social signals we send to each other and then interpret those like a human would. So if you had 500 humans in the car, they would look at this person on the side of the road and they would make the same decision and say, I think this person's going to run in front of us. Whereas if somebody is, is trying to hide their behavior, that's much harder. It's harder for humans to find. And so therefore, it would also be hard for machines to find. So I think the short answer to that from what I've seen so far is that's probably going to be a tough task. Thanks, Trey. So the next question comes from Patrick and it says, do you think AI will be able to determine information from data sets that we can't see and or understand in the data? If so, do you think there might be risks on relying on AI and its results if we do not understand how it got the results? And Patrick, feel free to jump in if you want to add any clarifying I, points to that. I think I understand the intention of the question. Is this kind of the root of the black box? If I don't understand how the black box works, should I trust it? Yeah, Patrick says yes. So again, actually back to that, that podcast I did with Sam, he said, and I thought this was a great way to think about it. He goes, you know, there are many AI or machine learning black boxes that we use today that we trust almost unequivocally. So if you use Waze or you use, Waze is more human data that's coming into it. But if you use Google Maps or Apple Maps, all that trip routing information is coming from machine learning. And it's basically a black box. You can't go ask them, how did you come up with that route? But you've done it enough times, you've used it enough times, you successfully got from A to B enough times using that information that you, be, you built your own level of trust with that particular black box. They're, the EU is doing some regulations, the European Union is doing some regulations around AI right now. And they're basically saying, look, if you can't explain how it makes the decisions, then it should be illegal. You know, like, is, if it's not explainable, it shouldn't be legal. And Dr. Jeffrey Hinton, who everybody on, on this call probably knows, who's a, a luminary in the field and one of the fathers of deep learning, his response was, if you had an AI doctor that had a 90% success rate curing cancer, but it was a black box and you didn't understand how it made the decision. And you had a human doctor with an 80% success rate. He was, his point was, I would rather go with the AI. <laughs> so I think it comes down to experience and having, having experience with that system and getting comfortable with that system over time. And we're building these systems everywhere. So I think it comes down to where are they in your environment and do you, you, know, do you use them? Do you trust them over time? like we do with our own relationships with humans. Do we have enough experience to build up that trust? Perfect, thanks, Troy. I don't see any more questions, but if folks wanna add a few more, I'll give them a minute. Maybe I'll ask you a question that came out of something that Ivan had said during your absence. And he said, you know, he's working for the CRA and sometimes this happens, you know, government aside, this can happen anywhere. Whereas your top managers may say, you know, go out and use AI. That should be the solution that you go use without at first identifying the problem. What advice would you have for someone right. in that type of situation where, you know, they're pushing AI and that might not be the approach that's actually needed? So, and I, I get the rationale, you know, because the leaders are, you know, they read a magazine or they're talking to their peers and they're either in industry, in, in government or in industry, and they hear, oh, we're behind, we're behind, we have to do AI, whatever that is. And so, so there becomes this kind of mandate and that generally gets handed down to this, you know, to the second tier, like the folks being mentioned here, where they get this edict, go do something with AI, find some use for it. I understand both sides of that equation because from the top down, there's no reason, I think at this point to say, well, we're probably not going to need AI as a, as a government agency is ludicrous because you can use it for so many different things. So you should build competence, you should build experience, you, 
and you can only do that by skinning your knees and building these projects and they don't have to be big but they do have to be executed so i think it's think of it as a long-term play and think of it as a way to build your team get some competence and some capability built into that team and to be able to assess hey how successful are we so they don't have to be gigantic mission critical things go find some low-hanging fruit and then go knock those out and build some momentum so i think it's art before the horse i don't know if i need technology and i think that where that comes in is is then doing that mapping between well you know hey so and so you said our three strategic priorities are a b and c ai doesn't really solve anything there so but what if we work on this other project which is also sort of important so i think it's just reconciling between what are your priorities one of which is do ai and you know move forward but that's not really a key strategic priority so i think it's just mapping between strategic priorities and what ai can and cannot do and as amanda said speak truth to power if they're like we want you to use ai to do priority c and you're like that's dumb that doesn't make any sense you know i really need data science tools or i need something completely different you should just be able to say that and say no this is the inappropriate place to use that we're absolutely going to fail Whereas if we find something else, hopefully there's a better chance of not failing because it's a slightly you know, more likely use case. Hopefully that helps. Awesome. Jacques That's, had another question there. Yeah, great answer, Troy. Yeah, so Jacques, maybe this will be our, our last question. So related question from earlier, what different advice would you give to a government organization looking to build an AI data science team versus a company? Should government look to consultants or outside tools more or less? I'm in a government data science team and trying to help my team get those early wins. Awesome. I would love to actually have this conversation with you offline. So I hope you'll reach, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll, have, I'll give you my response, but I'd love to continue that conversation offline. I think the versus industry, it's a size of organization question. So what I'm seeing is that the, the real budgets, the multi-billion dollar budgets and the real do-it-yourself hardcore, you know, AI and machine learning and data science projects running at scale with a big team, 50 to 100 people or more, those are, those are expensive projects and they can really only be undertaken by the largest agencies, probably federal. And so in, in the government sector, I would say, you know, the federal customers are the ones doing the big heavy lifting and the do it yourself internal projects. As you go down in size, down to the province or the state level or down to the municipal level, you're gonna to start to do things like maybe at the state level, you'll, you'll really leverage platforms. So you might leverage a Microsoft or Google or an Amazon machine learning platform that sort of takes a lot of the, the work out of building, that, building and managing the infrastructure. But as you get even further down, let's say the city level, you're probably not gonna go embark on building a data science team and you know, building up 50 people. You, just, you don't have the budget for it. You don't have the competence and you're not gonna attract those folks to be there for any long period of time. So you're probably going to buy off the shelf AI apps, AI security, AI customer service, AI chatbots for cust you know, customer engagement. So it really becomes, a, a, you know, do it yourself is for the biggest agencies platforms leveraging platforms is kind of for the state level agencies and then kind of buying ai ai apps off the shelf that's not to say that states and federal wouldn't buy things off the shelf or also leverage platforms but it's they're they're unlikely the states and the cities are unlikely to go build a gigantic do-it-yourself from scratch system hopefully that helps Awesome. And maybe one quick fire last question, our last one for the workshop. How does one avoid bias in AI? Very big question for a quick fire, <laughs> quick fire, but maybe some last thoughts to end there. You don't, you don't avoid it. Uh, bias, is, bias is built into humans, bias is built into data. Humans are often the most biased. So, and they're the ones collecting the data and putting it into the systems. So I don't think you ever avoid it i think you understand that it is something you need to mitigate and so the best companies that i've talked to again like booz allen with their modsy platform they literally have bias mitigation tooling to go and say okay 
we're going to vet this thing and we're going to vet this black box and we're going to have we're going to test it against a number of different sort of indexes and say is it spitting out you know biased results if it is we're going to go fix it we're going to go load different data sets into it so i think you assume 100 percent of the time there's always bias in the data and it will in bring in more bias over time as you bring in more data and it's a constant game of cross-checking it and auditing it, auditing it and verifying it and fixing it. Awesome. Thanks so much, Troy. Well, on behalf of Forward 50, I wanted to thank Troy once again for joining us today and for sharing his experiences, knowledge, and training to help us understand artificial intelligence, both in government and in industry. If you'd like to continue the conversation, I invite you to join us on Twitter using the hashtag Forward 50 or to use the matchmaking platform to connect directly with Troy to ask any additional questions you may have. Thank you all for joining us. And if you're interested in continuing to be part of the workshop track, join my colleague tomorrow Rob Butler at 1 30 for the workshop session what happens to humanity when biology and digital technology merge the day however is not over I encourage you all to head over to the main conference platform where you can now take part in a number of networking topic rooms from now until 5 30. hope to see you all there and see you tomorrow take care thanks Amanda thanks everybody thanks Troy